chapter 24, 23, 24, if you'd flip there, um, I'll catch up to you in just a moment. I want to bring back a um, little, uh, little word of uh, reminiscing. Uh, for those of you who had, uh, you know, kind of halfway decent uh, par parents or guardians, um, remember your birthday? Y'all remember? Just, seriously, right now, I want you to think back uh, when you're a kid, elementary age, you know, kind of kind of kid, and you, you got a birthday uh, coming up, and uh, finally, you know, finally gets here, and you wake up in the morning, and it's your birthday. Y'all can picture that, right? And so you're in a degree of uncertainty, uh, especially if you have a dad like me. You have no idea what's coming down the pike. Um, but so you, there's some uncertainty involved, but there's also some trust in that parent or those parents uh, in their, I don't want to use the word providence unless you're me, um, you know, but their, their control of the situation that is going to turn out fairly good. Why? Because one, they've been planning the day for quite a while. And number two, they have your best interest at mind. They're thinking about you. Okay, so you know you know all of that. So there's uncertainty, but there's there's some peace with the trust that's there. Um, one of the things that um, my boys uh, used to like on their that they would request on their birthday is treasure hunts. Okay, and so um, on a treasure hunt, uh, they need to learn how to do pacing, how to use a compass, how to use a map, all that kind of stuff. And and uh, a treasure map would be hidden. And, you know, they were, or, or several treasure maps would be hidden. And you know what? Every single birthday, they made their own choices, but they would find the maps they needed to find. How did that work? Okay, I mean, just think about that now. We're talking about God's providence here in a moment. This is, this is lame, but go with me on this. All right, so, th so they would make their own choices, but they would eventually find the maps. And then they'd have to get everything lined up right. So one team would have to get this thing lined up, this coordinates lined up. And they'd go through different places and finally land on their spot. And, and it'd be you know, a line between that and some other object. And then another team would line up their spot. And that, so everybody had to, all the teams had to work it out right. And you know what? They made their own choices but they ended up working it out right. And, and they find, uh, you know, they, they get the, the cross-section thing. And uh, the tr they'd be usually pretty close to, uh, to where the treasure was. Um, one time, the treasure was on the edge of a pond. And a little, little bit of a bank, kind of like this right here, but this high. And so some, a lot of the boys were up here. And then a few of us were down there. And, and you got the water. And uh, they, they got right to where the chain going to the treasure was in the middle of the pond. And right as they're you know, fixing to go, they, they spot it. And right as they're fixing to do that, this grayish black snake rises up like this out of the water. Little, it's a little guy, but I know what it is. It's a water moccasin. No other snake would do that. Rises up out of the water, even though it's a little guy. I am scared to death because the boys are like right there. This thing, these things are nasty. They'll, they'll come after you. 
And I'm, I'm like immediately freaking out. And the boys are like this. One of the boys had a shovel, and he just goes like this and goes right across the, the snake's neck, just swung. And it happened, to, and the snake goes like this and goes back under the water. And the boys on the bank up here, uh, they're going, that was, a, you know, a brother, I just put that there. Man, that thing was fake. That, that wasn't a real snake. The boys down here are going, no, that was a real snake. You know, and they fought about that the rest of the night. I never answered their question. But they eventually got the treasure. You know why? Because I'm providential. Well, maybe not like God, okay? And so that, that's, that's a, it's a lame illustration of kind of our walk with the Lord. We make very, very real choices in life. Your choices matter. What you think about, what you say, what you do, what you plan, as you reflect on the past and the future, walk with the Lord, study His Word, your choices matter a lot in the election, register to vote, and in every other area of life. At the same time, concurrent with that, we have a God, a Father, a Heavenly Father, who plans things in such a way that his plans come together in your life. It's kind of like every day is your birthday. And it's like the Father has been thinking about this day in your life for a long time. Indeed, Ephesians chapter 1, where they we're working out of as we study the book of Acts right now, from eternity past, before he ever made you or made anything, he thought about this day. He thought about you as if it was your birthday and this is the, you're the only person on the planet. It's your special day. And every day is your special day. Now the problem is some days seem like nightmares. Uh, and I have the privilege of walking with this congregation. Y'all are just absolutely Every one of you, just amazing, amazing uh, uh, saints walking with the Lord or on the way there. Uh, all of you need to trust, trust the Lord, but God you know, has the, his image going in you. The, this is an amazing church, and, it, and it's just what a blessing to walk with you. And, and I grow brokenhearted with you over, over the intense pains and struggles uh, that happen uh, in your lives. And some of our families and individuals, uh, single and again married and, and families, uh, going through some real emotionally grievous, strenuous times right now. And, and, and it might seem like we don't have a heavenly father, or he's not providential, or it certainly doesn't seem like my birthday today. Like he's been planning this day out for all of eternity past. Well, he has. And it's hard. Give me give you one illustration, we'll get into the text. I was, um, I don't know if I've mentioned this to you, but um, I, I've been approached by the police numerous times in my life, uh, you know. And, and one time I'm on a fishing boat, a fishing vessel, and um, one of the authorities, I don't know if it was a Coast Guard, somebody, Marine Patrol, whatever, uh, came up, and they knew we were up to no good. Uh, our captain had, and some crew members had been up to no good in time past. Uh, and so they boarded us, and they took our licenses, and we stood on the, on the uh, uh, back of the boat uh, with guns pointed at us. And uh, one of the guys was identified as a criminal out of Texas. And they're going to haul this guy off. And he's, he was like the good guy on the boat. You know, of all the people, like he was like the good guy. He was like the, the, the Christian that's like walking with God. And I looked up to this guy, you know. And I'm kind of going, this has got to be, this, you know, I don't even remember him being in Texas, you know. Um, and so they're fixing to haul him off. And somehow they worked it through right before cuffing and stuffing him that they figured out it wasn't the guy. And they let him go. Now, here's the illustration. What if you're walking out of church today and there they are waiting for you? And you are falsely accused, go to jail, and you're sentenced to prison for years. Is that a possibility? Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, we have an imperfect system, and yes, it's a possibility. Is it your birthday in the mind of God? Did God have this day planned from eternity past? Well, our hero in the story 
is uh, facing something like that. He's in the temple. Uh, that we're in the, in the history of the early church, the, uh, the, a book called the Book of Acts, the Acts of the uh, Early Church, Acts of the Apostles. And um, he's, in a, he's in a Jewish temple in, in um, you know, uh, the, the capital, uh, J Jerusalem um, of Israel. And uh, there in the temple, he is truly minding his own business. And he's worshiping God. And he's not even witnessing to, to folks. And he is grabbed by a mob. And uh, they're wanting to kill him. And they try to kill him. And then the Romans intervene. And he's hauled off and he goes before the Supreme Court of the Jewish people who killed Jesus, you know, the next day. And, and that didn't work out good for the, for the Jewish people to get him killed. And so he's in Romans, Roman hands and uh, he's, uh, he's unsure about the future. Uh, he knows he wants to talk about the resurrection that's driving him, but he's unsure about the future. And the Lord in chapter 23 and verse 11 of the book of Acts speaks these words to him. On the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, Take courage, as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome or bear witness to me at Rome also. Now that's you know, rare that we get a word from God going, here's you know, my plan for the future. But you can know that God has a plan for each one of us for the future, Back in Ephesians, we have uh, words like this. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Even though we're in the book of Acts, this is our theme verse for the day. Ephesians 1, 11. Just, just remember, Ephesians 1, 1, 1. Okay, there's no chapter 11 in the book, so you can't really mess it up. Chapter 1, verse 11. Ephesians 1, 1, 1. I want you to know this passage. This whole section is about God's providence and his plans and, and how they're good for us. And he says in verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance. In other words, we, once we trust Christ, because we're chosen by him, we trust Christ. Once we trust Christ, we all, it's as if we already have our inheritance, we enter the kingdom of God. We have eternal life. And we have, we are the inheritors of everything. And so we have an inheritance in him because that's his plan. So that's the resurrection. Now here's, here's the line I want you to remember. Having been predestined according to his purpose. If you're a believer, you were predestined to be a believer according to his purpose, listen now, who works all things after the counsel of his will. That's our theme verse today. Introduced it last week. Well, we introduced it a while back, but anyway, God works all things after the counsel of his will. And that certainly applies to us who have been predestined to be his children according to his plan and according to his purpose, to the praise of his glory. And so chapter 2, verse 10, we are created to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Before God ever made the world, he had works planned for you to do and I to do today. Happy birthday. For you to walk in those things. And an example of that is right here in this passage um, in, uh, in um, uh, the book of Acts where God's going you know, I got a plan, and your, the plan's coming together. Uh, the plan was introduced back in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Uh, he told the guy that went to witness to him or help him out, um, Go Ananias, he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, the Jewish people, and before kings. Like, how's that going to happen? If everybody makes their own choice, it falls in line with the plans of God for his life, and he does bear witness before kings. And so um, God comes to him and says, you know, remember way back that what Ananias shared with you, that I shared with Ananias, you're gonna go to Rome and stand before the emperor. How's that gonna happen? Just trust me on that. A lot of uncertainty, but here we got, again, another taste of God's providence who works all things after the counsel of his will. Remember, Paul wrote that Ephesian stuff about two years from now, but he wrote it from prison. So as, it's as if you get picked up today and you can write a letter home 
and you can say, now you're, you're sentenced to prison, you're sentenced, you don't know how long you're going to be there. You're sentenced, you might face, you're, you're facing the death penalty if you're like Paul. You don't know how it's going to come out. And you're able to write this from incarceration. I was predestined according to God's purpose who works everything after the counsel of his will. Could you write that? Paul wrote it from prison facing the death penalty. It's good theology. It's hard. It's hard. This is, this is hard stuff. But it brings a courageous lifestyle. All right, so uh, everything's going to work out good. And here's where we left off last week, verse 12 and following. A conspiracy is formed by over 40 guys. They're not going to eat anything until they kill this guy. And so they go to the Supreme Court, the Congress, and the President, and they get them together and go, I tell you what, we just need you guys to lie and say you want to have a council and another council. And um, on the way there, we're going to ambush the uh, entourage and we're going to kill Paul. He'll never even make it here. And so, like, yikes! Is that, is that, is there providence in that? Well, God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Yeah. But they're making their own choices and their evil choices. And here's where we pick it up. We, that was a cliffhanger. We left it hanging. Here's where we pick it up. Verse 16. But. That's a, that's a great word in the Bible. But. The son of Paul's sister. Like who's that? This is Paul's nephew. Like we don't even know Paul had a sister. Like he's got a sister and he's got a nephew. And a little bit later, he's going to be taken by the hand. So he might be like a really young, you know, like, like a kid. I mean, we just don't know. But all of a sudden, he appears. But the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush. What luck? Who would have thunk? Luck or providence? Heard of the ambush. And he came, just happenstance happened to be there at the right time how in the world would you hear you know but somehow you know he did and he came entered the barracks told paul paul said hey uh hey guy take this guy to the commander and let him uh you know report what the young man has uh reported to me and so uh the guy took him he goes to the commander uh verse 19 the commander takes him by the hand and stepping aside so maybe he's a young boy you know taking him by the hand i don't know um you know and uh, what is it that you got to uh, to say to me and he said uh you know it gives the story that more than 40 guys are, are going to be lying in wait if you take paul over to the uh, supreme court building for the jewish people uh they're going to be lying away they're going to ambush the uh you know the uh, uh the procession and they're going to kill paul uh, so I just want you to know that. Um, and therefore, the commander, verse 22, let the young man go instructing him, tell nobody you've notified me. He doesn't want to know, he doesn't want them to know that he knows the plot so that they don't form another plot, obviously. All right? So uh, that's the end of scene four. Um, and right there, you ask the question, um, is there, uh, in Paul's mind, uncertainty? Of course there's uncertainty. He doesn't know how it's going to come out, but he knows he's going to make it to Rome. He might get hurt on the way, but he knows he's going to make it there. Is there providence? Yeah. God works all things according to the counsel of his will. All right? Uh, scene number five. This commander guy, he called uh, to him the two centurions and said, get 200 soldiers uh, ready. Uh, on the, for the third hour of the night and proceed to Caesarea. So at night tonight, um, you know, get, uh, get 200 guys ready. Oh, by the way, throw in 70 horsemen so they can chase people down or stomp, stomp on people or whatever. Oh, and by the way, throw in 200 spear chuckers, all right? Uh, yeah, so that's 470 guys. Like, this is one prisoner. You know, like there's some old Jewish dudes that want to kill, you know. But, but here's the gig. Remember, we're at Passover, and there were literally hundreds of thousands of very zealous Jewish followers who would, to some degree, follow their leaders. And so he doesn't know, but there's going to be some kind of a you know, major uprising. I'm sure they're tapping all the, all the, uh, the stations and everything to try to get the, 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 the message, but they might miss something. You know, the cell phones are tapped, that kind of thing. But they might miss something, so, so he, they don't know. You know, you don't want just a few guys against 100,000 uh, angry Jewish people, even if they're carrying brooms, okay? You know, so, so that's the scene. He just doesn't know. And so um, they get this entourage together. He writes a letter, um, verse 26. He calls himself Claudius Lysias. So um, 
Claudius is the, is the guy. Uh, to most excellent governor Felix. It, he didn't really feel that way, but that's what you got to write. Greetings. Uh, when this man was arrested by the Jews and was about to be slain, I came upon them with the troops and rescued him. Thank you very much. Uh, a medal, I'll take any kind of medal, would be great, leave me a trophy. Having learned that he was a Roman, I see I'm on top of things, I got it under control here, and wanting to ascertain the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought down their Supreme Court, their council, the Sanhedrin, and found him to be accused over questions about their law. Uh, and and uh, under nothing uh, deserving of death, that's the best I can figure it out so far, but I don't have a handle on it, but, but know that I was, uh, I was there, you know, I, I took care of this situation. And when I was informed that there would be a plot against this man, in my shrewdness I sent him to you, also instructing his accusers to bring charges against him before you, over in Caesarea, that's about uh, 60 miles away, by the way. All right, so that's scene five. Um, any providence involved in that? Yeah, God works all things according to the counsel of his will. And it's a little bit closer to Rome where, you know, God has planned to send this guy. Um, and also, I will make you a witness to kings. And so God's plan is for Paul to witness to kings. And so, hadn't done that yet, but here it comes. Free will of people making, you know, four, over 40 guys making their choice to, you know, get the, their, their Supreme Court to lie and Congress to lie and, and then to, to, to murder somebody. All of that stuff. People doing their own free choices. People plotting evil. And yet, puts Paul a little closer to Rome. Interesting. And he'll meet some kings, lesser kings than Caesar, while he's there on the way to Rome. Fascinating how God uses uh, evil people to carry out his plan. Scene number 6, uh, chapter 23, verse 31. So the soldiers, in accordance with their orders, uh, they brought Paul by night to uh, Antipor, uh, whatever that city is. Um, that's about halfway there, roughly. Um, and uh, and uh, they spent the night, and then the, some of the soldiers left, and they carry on to uh, Caesarea, which is near the coast, and delivered the letter to the governor and also to Paul, and also Paul to uh, the governor. Verse 34. When he had read it, that's the letter from Claudius, uh, he asked whether the guy, where the Paul, uh, you know, where was he from, and he learned he was from Cilicia, and uh, he has um, governorship over Judea and Cilicia, so uh, he's under, um, you know, his jurisdiction, this is Felix, uh, and so, okay, Paul falls under my jurisdiction, I guess I got to deal with this, verse 35, and he said, I will give you a hearing after your accusers arrive. That's what he says to Paul. Uh, and so they got to come up. They got to bring the accusations and we'll have court and I'll try you then. Uh, and I, he gave orders to the, uh, the guards to keep him in Herod's Praetorium, uh, which we'll get into the Herodian family probably next week a little bit. It's very, it's, it kind of brings light to the story, but don't worry about that right now. And so uh, a guy named Herod built this place, uh, Herod Agrippa I. Um, and um, and uh, it's a nice governor's kind of residence, but it's fortified, and it's got some places to lock people up, evidently. Um, you know, so if you're Paul, there you are now in Caesarea. Uh, some uncertainty going on? Yeah, you don't know what's fixing to come down the pike, but you, you know you're heading to Rome, but besides that, you, you know, you don't know how long it's going to take and what's going to happen to you and how much pain's along the way. Uh, any providence involved in this? Yeah, we already talked about that. God works all things according to the counsel of his will. All right, so here it is. Scene number seven, Acts chapter 24, verse one. After five days, the high priest uh, Ananias came down with some elders. That's, that's a 60 mile trip for these old boys. Um, and so you can kind of do the math on how long it would take. Um, you know, I don't think they had a monorail set up, so they're probably walking or, you know, on, you know, maybe horses or donkeys or carts or, you know, whatever. It's gonna take, that's gonna be a, like a day or two day journey, depending on how fast they travel. Uh, with a certain attorney named Tetelus. Uh, that guy's charging you know by the hour. He's also charging somebody back in Jerusalem uh, by the hour at the same time. You, you understand that, right? Howard, you with me on this one? Good, okay, all right, all right, all right yeah, yeah. 
Uh, you know, so, so this, guy's, this guy, he don't mind how long it is because he's making some money on the way. You know, he knows he's charging by the hour. So he goes with them. And they brought charges to the governor against Paul. And after Paul had been summoned, to tell us, began accusing him, saying to the governor. And so here's the charges against Paul. First of all, um, everybody in there needs a bucket. Okay, because it's going to make people nauseous how he opens up. All right. Uh, he says this in verse 2. Since we have through you attained much peace. Right there you can hear people start to, to upchuck. You know, including probably the governor. You know, and because they, they hate. This, it's the Roman authorities who are occupying their land. They're taxing the Jewish people. These are the Romans. Taxing the Jewish people to death. And committing all kinds of atrocities and murders against them. They hate the Romans and everybody involved, especially their leadership. But this guy is an attorney, so he knows how to kiss up to these guys. We have some good attorneys, I'm sure. I know we do, but anyway, so he's, try, he's, he's trying to kiss up to this guy. And so he says, we've obtained much peace through you. Again, every, people are starting to uh, uh, upchuck. And since by your providence reforms are being carried out in this nation, again, you know, only reforms that are good for the uh, for the um, uh, their, their dictatorship over the Jewish people, we acknowledge this in every way and everywhere. All of our people just just we, we have your picture up everywhere, you know, and we're just I'm always talking about you. We all love you, most excellent Festus, with all thankfulness. Again, that's just nothing but nauseating, but nonetheless, that's how he starts. Verse four. But that I may not weary you any further, <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, I beg you to grant us by your kindness a brief hearing. And so here it is. Here's, he just goes, goes right to the charges. Charge number one, this guy's a pest. Eh, it could be translated, probably should be translated troublemaker, uh, which Rome didn't like troublemakers. They wanted peace because they wanted taxation and they wanted as much money as they could get. And they had to send their soldiers out to squelch trouble and they didn't want trouble they just wanted peace uh not for the welfare of the people but because they didn't want to have to exercise uh, military control over the folks so this guy's a troublemaker uh that would get rome's attention to some degree uh it kind of saying the same thing charge number two he stirs up dissension against all the jews throughout the world uh, he just he's a troublemaker everywhere stirring up dissension among the jews um, by the way, did he stir up dissension? It, it, do Christians stir up dissension? Let me just stop for a second. Do Christians stir up dissension? Do we make trouble? But, but, but now think about this, though. I, again, I'm going to take kind of the other side. You know, if you witness to somebody and they get really mad at you, and a whole bunch of people get mad at you, and there's a big ruckus in the family, and it, are you the one causing the ruckus? No, you're, you're loving them and sharing truth with them. They're causing a ruckus. Right? I, I don't make family members and citizens hate me, approach them in a loving way. But there's something about sharing the gospel and, and guiding folks toward repentance that ticks people off. Am I the reason that they're angry? Are you the reason they're angry and stirring things up and in this case causing riots? No, Paul's lovingly sharing the truth with them, which they all should have believed as Jewish people. It's they that are causing it. So it's, it's just, it's interesting perspective, you know, um, how uh, Christians are blamed, and yet we're loving people and, you know, sacrificing to share with them. But it's going to happen. Okay, so stirs up dissension, and you probably, some of us here probably been, if we had the story, uh, the times for the stories, uh, in, your, in your places of employment, that kind of thing, you've probably been fired. So we probably have people that have been fired from jobs because you're stirring, up you're, you're stirring up trouble in your company by simply humbly, on break time or after work, witnessing to people. You know, but you're, you're blamed for it. Uh, number three. He's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, that would be the, the Christians. That, that is true. He is a, he's a leader. Uh, ring, the word ring doesn't really need to put it in there. It usually has negative connotations. But he's a leader of, of the uh, Christians. Uh, that is true. And then uh, uh, number six, uh, he even tried to uh, desecrate the temple, uh, which is not true like whatsoever. He did the exact opposite. By the way, that, that ringleader thing might carry the connotation he's some big boy in Christianity. And quite frankly, Christianity is a fairly flat, 
uh, kind of movement, and uh, nobody wields that much power. There is no pope in Christianity, never has been, never will be, all right? Uh, not in biblical Christianity, you can't find that in Scripture. Um, and so, uh, uh, verse 6, he desecrated the temple. And then we arrested him and wanted to judge him according to our law. Is that how you all remember it? Not quite. We grabbed him and we wanted to kill him. Never mind uh, any kind of a trial. Um, or he might be talking about the Supreme Court thing, uh, that appearance as well. Anyway, he says, uh, Lysias, the commander, came along. And with much violence, kind of a little dig there, you know, against Lysias, uh, took him, he evidently doesn't like that guy, took him out of our hands with much violence. Uh, we were just, it was just, a, on our part, it was just a peaceful protest. Never mind we were trying to beat the man to death. It was just a peaceful protest. And this thug, you know, uh, this, this national thug comes along and with much violence takes him out of our hands. Fortunately, that, things like that never happened in America. All right, so, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's how he perceived it, uh, ordering his accusers to come before you. So we got to make this 60 months. We could have just killed him right there, got all this over with, but, you know, that you all had to interfere, and now we got to make this 60-mile trek, you know, one direction to do all of this. What a pain in the neck for all of us. Just, like, just we got to kill the guy. And by examining him yourself concerning all these matters, you will be able to discern or ascertain the things which we accuse him. And... All the other Jews, when, when uh, this attorney is done, all the Jews joined in the attack, asserting that these things were so. So everybody just, you know, just coming out of nowhere, they're kind of surrounding him, and they're just yelling stuff and saying that, you know, that, that it's right, this guy needs to die, it's obvious, you know, we need to kill this guy. Now, if you're Paul, are you uncertain at this moment about how things are going to come out? Yeah, to some degree, but you know you're going to make it to Rome, but it might be painful on the way there. You don't know how long it's going to take. Is there any providence involved in this? God works all things according to the counsel of his will. So these evil people making their own evil choices and every word that's shared, not from God, but it's according to the plan of God. So, yeah, there's providence in this, even if Paul can't see it, but he probably does. Uh, he's an astute uh, uh, kind of a guy. Uh, it also begs a question right there, since Paul does understand God's providence at this time, that not one, one word is shared that got past God in some way, that God's allowing uh, everything to take place, and it's all going to fall into his plan. Should Paul respond, I mean, if, 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 if Paul's believing in the providence of God, that God's just going to work it all out, he's going to you know, go to Rome, does Paul ever need to just open his mouth to anybody now? Can't he just sit back and go, I'm just going to watch the show. I'm going to make it to Rome anyway, no matter what I do. Uh, does he even need to open his mouth? Why would he open his mouth to protect himself? He got God's providence. And yet God in his providence asks us to do the right thing every step of the way, but in the same time to trust his providence. And so, yeah, he should open his mouth. Because he wants to be a witness to these folks. And he's going to trust God that no matter what he shares, and now he's kind of very much encouraged to share whatever he wants to, because he's going to make it to Rome, though it might be a painful journey. And so he gives these words. I'm going to close with these words. Um, verse, uh, verse 10. Knowing This is from Paul to this, uh, in this courtroom scene. Knowing that for many years you have been a judge of this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. So not, not a lot of kissing up there. Uh, he's respectful, as he was with the Jewish people, as he was in the Supreme Court. So he's respectful here in the, in the, in the Roman court. Um, but he doesn't go over the top with a bunch of flattery. Uh, verse 11. Uh, but he's respectful. And, and that's, again, that's a good example for us to be respectful. Since you can take note of the fact that no more than 12 days ago, I went to Jerusalem to worship. My, my motive was to go there, and, and I worship there. Uh, I, in the temple, nor in the synagogue, nor anywhere in the city of Jerusalem, did anybody find me carrying on a discussion with anybody or causing a riot? I, I didn't even witness. I didn't even pass out tracts while I was there. I didn't do anything. I, I was truly there just worshiping on this, on this Jewish national holiday. Nor can they prove to you the charges of which they now accuse me. Now, that's interesting because, you know, we think of Paul rolling into town and just blasting away at people. 
And yet, here we got a little taste. Now, if he's not being in town very long, he's got to start witnessing earlier than this. But he's taking time to grow relationships, but not a lifetime. Some of us were like, well, I'm, grow- I'm going to witness to my family, I'm going to witness to my neighbors, but I've got to take a little more time to grow the relationship. We talk a year from now. Well, I've got to take a little more time. We talk another year from now. I've got to take a little more time. You know, and the years turn into the decades. That's not what we're talking about here. But he has taken time because he has apparently has the time to grow a trusting relationship with local folks. All right? So he's taking the time to do that. It's a good example for us being respectful uh, to them in, uh, in every way. Um, this I admit to you, and again, we're, we're closing down with this section. This I admit to you, that, or, or I confess to you. It's, a, it's a, a confession, like not a confession of guilt, it's a confession of faith in Christ. And I hope we can all make this confession even today. This I confess to you, verse 14, that according to the way, which is, that's Christianity, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, which they call a sect, I do four things. And again, this is, this is where I want us to, 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 to focus right now. Is this my life? Is this my confession before God and before others? And before my family, for my kids? Number one, I serve, or the Greek word is, uh, is worship. You can translate it either way. It's kind of a worshipful service, like what a, you know, like what a, a pastor does. It just, you know, this I, I, I'm just going to translate it worship. I, I, I worship the God of our fathers, the true biblical God, the God of the Bible. Number two, I believe everything in the Bible, in the law and the prophets, everything that's written. So I worship God. I hold to the Bible and live it out. Number three, verse 15, I believe in a coming resurrection in which all people will be judged, the, those who've been made righteous and those who are unrighteous. And in light of this, I maintain a clear conscience before God and before others. What if America did that? Simple four-point confession that I would like for us to take home and really pray through and say, is that, if, if you had to describe your life, where it really mattered, is this how you would describe your life? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for grace today. We give you thanks that we are able to be people who trust Christ as Savior, receive the gift of eternal life, the gift of peace with you, the gift of a life of worship, of just walking with a focus on you. Is that my life, Lord Jesus? Do I characterize my life, number one, as a life of worship? Number two, Lord Jesus, have, have, have you worked in me such a way where my Life is a life of focus on your word, the law, the prophets, the word of God, your laws, your principles, your word, your promises, your Bible. Do I focus my life on your word to guide my steps? Do I want to know your word? Do I study your word? Do I pray through your word? Do I meditate on your word through the day? Do I worship? Do I walk in your word? Number three, am I focused on the coming resurrection, on the day when you come back again? Does that drive me to share with others your second coming? You're coming back. You'll split the sky. Those who trust you will rise up to meet you. Lord Jesus, am I motivated for eternity, looking at what matters on that day. And number four, Lord Jesus, am I living with a clean conscience, apologizing to you and to others where I 
where I sin, where I, where I blunder, where I make mistakes, but just keeping a clean conscience with others and with you. Is that my life? Lord Jesus, we give you thanks again for your forgiveness of every bad thing we've ever done as we trust you and what you've done for us on that cross. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your providential care for us. Thank you that we can live lives focused on the resurrection and that coming day, that great hope that we have. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day and your providential work in us and around us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have uh, anything you want prayer for, any questions uh, or you know, just whatever it may be, um, I and, and some other leaders will be here with masks on. You know, feel free to come on up. Uh, you can use any of the doors. We've got small, life groups, small groups for all ages. God bless you and God make you a blessing.